So yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for your very interesting presentation. Um, so our uh, presentation is also based on the paper that we've read that was a 2017 scenario and many of the aspects that you addressed now mm -hmm. uh, were not within this scenario. So there might be uh, explain why we comment, critique on some aspects that were addressed now. Um, so we structured our presentation in the following way. Um, we start with a very quick summary, we can basically even skip it. Um, and we come to the discussion section, which we structured also according to the main principles, sufficiency, efficiency and renewables, and then uh, address some aspects of the political feasibility before we pose some open questions for the discussion. So about summary, maybe like one, some aspects that we found very interesting is that it's really not about predicting the future, but um, about providing a viable option for this more sustainable uh, energy future. And it also had many of those practical aspects and um, policies and really like making, uh, helping decision makers and then integrating this long-term perspective, long-term imperatives in their short-term decisions. Um, so about this concept of sufficiency, we also talk about a lot. It, as we can see, it really makes up a lot, big part of the reduction in the energy consumption. And then, for example, as in the in the housing sector, this increase in like increasing amount of people per house and rehabilitating existing buildings rather than buying uh, building new ones. And this, in some sense, might also lead to um, at least in this specific sector, then a reduction of economic activity and like keeping this in mind we'll like quickly discuss now the concept of green growth and then we see how this relates to each other so um, according to the united nations environment program green growth is about absolute decoupling of gdp growth from environmental impact and resource use so it's about really can we uh, a way in which we can keep growing while at the same time reducing absolute uh, amounts of emissions and of resource use. And uh, Hickel and Callis, for example, in their paper, Is Green Growth po uh, Possible? addressed a lot of those studies and reviewed the empirical evidence, um, mainly based on model-based projections that include in different parameters for different scenarios with different levels of technology, etc. And they really come to the overwhelming conclusion that no green growth is not possible. We cannot achieve it. And therefore also uh, without, um, since we cannot grow and absolutely decouple from resource use and carbon emissions, um, when we keep growing, this cannot uh, in any way be aligned with the Paris Agreement, uh, neither with the 1.5 degree goal nor the less ambitious two degree goal. And so um, then, in response to this, the Dree Growth Scholarship uh, proposes that basically a reduction of economic activity is inevitable, uh, especially in high income nations, and um, that otherwise we will uh, not be able to stay within the ecological and social boundaries. And now, given this lack of scientific evidence for green growth, and then also the internal sufficiency ambitions of the Negawatt scenario, uh, we just uh, pose basically the question, does the Negawatt scenario, because we've seen it includes sufficiency in many aspects and that might also come with economic uh, reduction of economic activity, but does it also have this like sufficiency with respect to the entire economic activity and like then in the sense of a transformation to a degrowth scenario. And uh, as we've seen in your presentation, this was already addressed to some extent as you like the, in a sense like this providing human well-being uh, why staying within the social or planetary boundaries is one of those key aspects. But yeah, we wanted to also know your opinion on this whole green growth, degrowth debate. Um, and then I will yeah. give to Julian. So as we were reading the paper, we were also like tackling the efficiency part. We were wondering like efficiency for whom? Uh, first of all, there is the possibility of having like rebound or recoupling effect because there is an, so this means that there is an increase of consumption due to the reduction of unitary cost. Like that is, also, that is on fr from one side. And on the other side, there might be the possibility of virtual decoupling. So this means the idea of that inside the national boundaries, 
there is a virtual decoupling of energy, consu energy consumption from growth. And this can be actually like going farther and farther uh, till the threshold of potential energy efficiency uh, uh, like uh, sits, like can see till the point of like we arrive to the full potential energy efficiency. But with technology moving forward and forward, like basically like this point, this threshold would be also moving forward and forward. So uh, can you? Yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. So we were uh, wondering and we were like more looking into a global scale and you know, we were looking uh, like to the high income countries. We were asking like, is there decoupling in the high income countries? Where are the resources of these countries coming from? And we see that uh, they ha the high income countries are appropriating and using uh, like uh, resources from and from the global south or other countries. Um, yeah, here we can see the net trade embodied energy. So uh, we we were we ask ourselves: Do high income countries really need to become more efficient for the ecological transition? Is that what we are aiming for? At Al House Twenty Three. Uh, yeah, divided uh, 133 countries into three clusters, and they found this interesting cluster three where France is actually. They name it reproduction of the core, and they found that basically they are uh, achieving a lot of uh, socioeconomic development uh, <laughs> by <laughs> appropriating from external. Uh, Eco external ecologic and impact and global value chain participation and value capture. Thus, uh, they made this modeling of uh, the ecological global transition. And we can see actually that efficiency in core countries, which France is part of, would increase unequal exchange while um, like keeping the same or worst periphery domestic impact so we are wondering like efficiency for whom would this be just for the world thank you julio uh, hello everyone and thank you very much for your uh, presentation and now i would like to focus more on renewable energy production but from a different uh, perspective and uh, as you already pointed out with the negative scenario we have that this type of production is increased in an ambitious but realistic way in order to cover 100 percent of our remaining energy needs by 2050 so actually as we can see uh, from this uh, graph uh, low carbon energy sources uh, generally require more mineral uh, to build comparing to traditional one uh, here we have uh, that wind takes leads especially offshore wind and actually within a negabat scenario wind is presented as a main source of uh, electricity in the future but as we can see uh, it's also followed, uh, closely falls by uh, onshore wind and uh, solar energy now, uh, when talking about um, this uh, rapid deployment of clean energy uh, technologies also implies a significant increase in the requirements for these uh, minerals. And that's uh, what this graph shows us. Uh, so taking example uh, of cobalt, so demand for cobalt could be anything uh, from 6 to 30 times higher than its level in uh, 2020. Um, of course, we have here that uh, International um, Energy Agency employs two different uh, scenarios when uh, showing these uh, results, which are sustainable development scenario and stated uh, policy uh, scenarios. And now we have that uh, this increase in demand uh, actually raise many questions, especially in relation to peripheral uh, countries. Uh, so based on literature, I tried to uh, group some of them and we can start uh, with a complex uh, supply chain. Uh, and the fact that um, Actually, production of uh, mineral nowadays is really uh, concentrated in specific uh, geographic areas. As an example, we can take that, uh, for example, Congo uh, and um, China were responsible for 70% of uh, cobalt production in 2019. Uh, also, uh, it implies uh, possibility of creation of commodity cartels, uh, major groups of uh, major pr producers of um, groups of major producers of uh, minerals that actually try to uh, maximize profit by cooperation on price, on production, uh, pricing, production and um, distribution. 
Here we also can talk about higher exposure uh, to uh, climate risks and fact that um, uh, actually, it uh, poses greater challenges uh, in order to achieve and to ensure that reliable and sustainable uh, supplies. Now, I would like also to talk about uh, governance risks and the fact that, uh, let's say, major producers of uh, minerals nowadays are uh, characterized as uh, unstable or extremely unstable uh, countries. Um, it's uh, based on worldwide the governance indicator. So we have that uh, nowadays peripheral country really uh, struggle to benefit from all valuable uh, resources that they have of minerals due to political instability, due to uh, weaker uh, governance as well. Um, also, we can here talk about risk of uh, risk because of uh, corruption and fact that uh, within that uh, mineral supply chain we can have corruption uh, at any point, uh, starting from issue of issue of uh, exploration, also exploitation licenses, as well as uh, collecting of taxes and fees, and so on. Uh, last but definitely not least are uh, social risks and the fact that peripheral country are uh, peripheral country usually have that. Um, weaker environmental regulation first of all but also weaker uh, labor standards and due to that we uh, have a um, uh, possibility of environmental degradation and also exploitation of uh, local uh, communities uh, here i list just some of them as a, such as uh, violation of human rights lack of transparency lack of safety standards labor health issue uh, but also we have that uh, sourcing of some minerals are unfortunately connected to uh, child uh, labor uh, one example is uh, cobalt and that's why why some uh, scholars named cobalt as uh, blood diamond of this uh, century. After all this information I <laughs> just dropped, we were really interesting to hear your opinion on uh, how can the benefits of renewable uh, energy development as presented within a negative scenario uh, be maximized, while in the same time minimizing all these negative impacts of mineral uh, extraction and in periphery countries. Thank you. Please continue now. So yeah, overall, we were also wondering about the political feasibility of the plan, how to reconciliate the interest of the stakeholders. Uh, so the, here's the institutional perspective of, of practices and outcomes. We have a political interest, ideas, institutional system, uh, practices to get outcomes. This is interconnected. But this also, uh, like in the energy system, this is broader. We have also energy users, energy industries, lobbying, which is also very important. But also, like overall, we were wondering, like on a global scale, how would this be uh, pol like political uh, feasible? And yeah, and but because we see dangers of uh, dangers, sorry, of an unstable mid-transitional period and which would be like uh, the rise of low carbon capital and the decrease of uh, high carbon capital, we would see uh, there, there might be the possibility of um, uh, yeah, like unstable demand, oversupply, undersupply, etc. And this would translate into the real economy, um, employment, the carbon, uh, like public debt, etc., etc. So we really need to make a plan make a plan on the bigger scale and on the global perspective. Yeah, and overall, these are <laughs> some <laughs> questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, that's great, really. Uh, I mean, you, 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 you really touch on a lot of very uh, fundamental issues and, uh, and, and which also show why, uh, as I said, uh, we uh, try to embed our national scenario in a European and global vision because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Um, well, on, on, on the first part on like sufficiency, efficiency and renewables, uh, I would start saying that I mean, the, 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 the criticism or the questions you raise about the uh, real impact of, of efficiency and the real impact of renewables and particularly the, lack, the, the risk that this is 
reproducing value capture and resources and value capture by the most developed uh, countries uh, on, on, on the expense of others shows why sufficiency is crucial. I mean, if you only, uh, I mean, uh, efficiency, for instance, shifting to electric cars, I mean, it, it's uh, a low carbon option, option, of course, which is why uh, everyone is considering it, but it's also an ef uh, efficiency uh, option because electric cars are much more efficient than thermal ones. But if you just uh, substitute uh, existing cars by electric cars, I mean, and, and uh, if you want to do it faster than the uh, normal rate of replacement of the uh, car stock, because you need to decarbonize, and you aim for reproducing the same system, I mean, let's go for electric SUVs instead of thermal SUVs, and we are fine, then you will increase energy consumption, increase the use of resources, and therefore increase the problems you are pretending to solve, particularly in, a, in an international perspective. So, uh, I mean, articulating sufficiency and efficiency and substitution by renewables, and I mean, whether you add uh, nuclear in the, in, in the picture doesn't make a change, um, I mean, is, is key if we want to get to sustainability, um, which, uh, and I, I just want to, to stress that, uh, I mean, uh, the graph you showed by the IEA on the, uh, on the uh, consumption of different, uh, different um, uh, generation uh, options, like offshore, nuclear, and so on, I mean, it, it is obviously a, uh, true, but I mean you need to put it in perspective first. None of the materials that would increase through shift from oh, not shift. I mean, if you choose renewables rather than nuclear to develop low carbon generation, leaving aside the fact that it's uh, much uh, much cheaper and much faster, uh, you will use more materials per kilowatt installed. But these are not critical materials. Uh, I mean, the, or I mean, either they are not critical materials, uh, or this increase in critical materials is not very significant when you put this uh, in uh, the uh, global perspective of how much of these critical materials we use. Uh, I mean, the, uh, there's no uh, rare earth. In, uh, in, in wind power, apart from a bit of uh, no dime in, uh, in uh, offshore wind that, that could be avoided. Uh, but you, you, will, you will use copper, for instance. But I mean, copper is critical for electrification, <coughs> not because of renewables. Uh, and uh, what I've show, shown uh, with the overall uh, uh, material footprint is that when you put the uh, increase use of some materials due to renewables in uh, a global picture of the uh, decrease of consumption of raw materials thanks to a global transformation. I mean, it, it doesn't make a significant difference to, uh, to uh, develop renewables. So there is an issue with resources, of course, but it's not critical to the implementation as soon as you uh, start with sufficiency. Um, the, uh, so that, that you know, yeah, shows that we uh, need to, uh, uh, to, to think about uh, uh, sufficiency and growth. Um, as I said, we don't like the growth, the growth debate because, um, I mean, we, we, we think it's really f not framing the, the, the debate in, um, in, in positive terms. Uh, um, what we emphasize is that uh, there are obviously a lot of economic activities that are considered positive when, uh, when uh, assessed through uh, GDP, but, are, but that are clearly negative when assessed in terms of contribution to sustainability. So what we need is to, is to reduce, skip, 
uh, shift or phase out of those activities. Um, and we need to develop some other activities at the same time. I mean, we need to develop thermal retrofitting of buildings, uh, even if we build less houses in a country like ours. Uh, we need co to develop collective transport. We need to uh, produce less cars, but uh, much more bikes and e-bikes sometimes. Uh, we uh, need to uh, develop uh, uh, recycling, to develop uh, repairing uh, activities. Uh, we need to develop local services. So, I mean, the, uh, the uh, global uh, output might be positive. We are just saying uh, GDP is not the good indicator to, to discuss if that evolution is positive and negative. And what we would need is uh, models that are able to quantify the uh, global output of uh, such scenarios. But uh, uh, we, uh, we had uh, the uh, uh, 2017 scenario uh, run through global economic models, um, one called 3Me, developed by ADEM and OFCE, uh, which is a Sciences Po uh, economic lab, and another one through Ima, uh, called Imaclim Air, uh, which is uh, developed and, uh, and run and shared uh, by uh, 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 CIRED, which is a CNRS uh, unit. Um, in both cases, the results were positive. I mean, a, 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 an ambitious scenario like Negawatt is positive when it comes to GDP, power purchase, jobs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then you get, you, you, you look into uh, the black box. Um, uh, one of the models had a very important framing assumption, which was the evolution of the, of the productivity rate of work. Okay. And they used a kind of linear assumption that it has been, it has been increasing this uh, rate quite uh, linearly since 150 years, so they use they just use that trend, and uh, at some point we ask, okay, what what happens if you change that number? And that produces more differences in the results of one scenario. That the difference you get with this factor between two scenarios. In other words, the key is how much productivity of work will evolve in the different trajectories. But the models can't say that, so the models are kind of blind to the question we need to answer. So there, again, there's a lot of work to do, and we, we, we are, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of reflection, uh, like prosperity without growth from Tim Jackson and his, uh, his uh, team in, uh, at CUSP in, uh, in the UK. We are connected to them in the Fulfilled Project I uh, referred to. We are discussing with Eloi Laurent, which is uh, bearing the, uh, this uh, idea of post-growth economy uh, in, uh, in France and is trying to uh, put sufficiency at the core of this uh, post-growth reasoning. So there's a, a lot of work going on, but we are, we, are, we are still far from clear answer and even further from, uh, from uh, convincing answers for policymakers who have been you know, uh, used for so many years to uh, uh, base their uh, decision making on uh, existing uh, macroeconomic models. Um, very fast on uh, the uh, political feasibility on a global level. Um, I mean, you're, you're completely right to, uh, to, to, to put this uh, as a major issue. I told you about the, uh, the uh, democratic aspect of implementing sufficiency. Uh, I actually think we have three obstacles in, uh, for implementing the kind of fair, deep, uh, just uh, and uh, of course uh, sustainable transition uh, we are uh, talking about. The first one is democracy. We need, uh, we need uh, 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 working democracy. We don't need broken democracies and we don't need even non-democratic countries to implement this because it can only come through a democratic process of 
uh, understanding and implementing by everyone on every scale the kind of, uh, this kind of transformation. Uh, but that is the least of the three, uh, the least, least difficult of the three obstacles. The second one is economics, not in the sense of GDP growth post growth, but in the sense that incumbents, I mean, we are faced with major incumbents working on a global scale, to some extent more powerful than states and governments, and they develop consumption patterns and systems and models that have nothing to do with, although they are talking a lot about decarbonizing, of course, but in a way that is uh, what you've shown with the uh, possible rebound effect of efficiency and predating effect of uh, renewables and, uh, and cars and so on. Um, so we, we need, and, and I really don't think we can uh, wait for these to collapse. That will be too long for, for other more sustainable and more, uh, I mean, uh, 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 better uh, businesses to take over will take too long. So we need to find a way to convince these big companies to change and um, that is what I mean by Green Deal. I mean the European Green Deal no, today uh, it has nothing to do with that. I mean we need to uh, get to a kind of uh, agreement where uh, we collectively cover stranded assets massively uh, in exchange of a complete shift of investing in the kind of economy that we are talking about. If, if we don't get there, that won't happen. And the third and even bigger obstacle is geopolitics. The transition we are talking about is shifting from resources related uh, interdependencies that have been framing geopolitics for more than one century. And it's, I mean, Countries will not let that happen. Uh, and in, in a world where the uh, international governance is, uh, I mean, weaker than uh, ever for uh, at least uh, for, the, for the past uh, few decades, I, mean, I, I don't know how we do that. But uh, I mean, think of the uh, petrol states. I mean, why would they? Uh, get into transition if, again, we don't provide them with uh, something in exchange. And as we are not ready to do that, uh, because we are just saying, okay, we shift from oil to lithium, and uh, okay, too bad, you are not producing it, we're going to get dependent from others. I mean, that doesn't work. And uh, I think the, 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 the crisis we are living today is, to some extent, linked to that perspective. These are bad news, but the good news, as you say, is we have scenarios, I mean, not only f uh, the, the one by Negawatt on the French level, but uh, a lot of scenarios, a lot, um, we know what needs to be done. So it's really no a matter of uh, uh, building, building uh, political alliances and, uh, and, and, and getting on the ground and convincing and, uh, and, 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 and politically fighting. But, uh, I mean, I think the, the situation is uh, better than it was when uh, we, uh, I mean, a lot of people thought there were no uh, scenarios to uh, get to uh, sustainability and we didn't have uh, so much powerful tools. Like, I mean, renewables have some downsides as, as, as you've shown, but uh, at least they are delivering and they are delivering fast.
because uh, sun, um, wind, or bio gas, for example, is very dependent on circumstances and intermittent. Mm -hmm. How would you react to those comments? It was touched in your uh, presentation as well. How would you address that criticism of um, ensuring stability of grid, for example? Because it is one of the main concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to be frank, I, um, I mean, I, I understand that you raised the question because as you say, uh, there's uh, still a lot of literature uh, and, and comments going on. I, I, I would say it's almost an obsolete question, an, an obsolete debate. Uh, because, uh, as I said, renewables are uh, deploying very fast. Um, and uh, the, uh, I mean, th there's a lot of innova innovation going around to, f to uh, develop options for e electric systems to accommodate with that. Um, maybe one, one key point to understand uh, this is um, rather than intermittency, to speak about their variability. Um, and it's very important because of course, they are variable, but they are predictable. I mean, we, we will all agree that there won't be sun, there won't be photovoltaic uh, generation at 11 o'clock, uh, 11 p.m. on uh, the uh, uh, 2nd of February, uh, 2038. We know. So well, that's the easy part, but uh, I mean, we, 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 we can forecast very precisely uh, the uh, amount of uh, uh, wind power and photovoltaic power uh, that will be generated like 40 hours uh, uh, up front. And we can forecast with some advance what is really feared when you are talking about this variability, which is long periods without wind, especially in winter. Um, so it's, uh, it's very important because since you can predict it, you can put solutions to deal with it. And that is flexibility of demand, of course, and storage options. And uh, we, we know today that uh, batteries on a big scale for a rather short-term uh, needs and again with the uh, concern on the uh, overall level which again let me uh, uh, le leads me to say that sufficiency is key to uh, meet uh, the uh, I mean to, to, to deal with uh, that issues also uh, but uh, we have short-term storage and uh, we have uh, an increasing confidence in long-term storage, especially through uh, what is called power to gas, using uh, variable electricity when it's in excess to, uh, uh, through electrolysis to produce hydrogen, which you either keep as such or combine with CO2, for instance, from purifying biogas to get uh, synthetic methane which you could keep and use at other, uh, other time. And, uh, so, I mean, the, the, the building bricks of that system are mature enough to project that when we need them, that's by 2030, 35, they will be ready to be implemented. Then the issue is the cost and so on, but I mean, an increasing number of scenarios uh, consider that this is feasible, even IEA, I mean, IEA in its uh, net zero roadmap projects uh, 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 an electric system where 90% uh, of electricity is renewable, 9% is nuclear, and 1% is, I mean, uh, also renewable, uh, but, uh, but uh, gas, like uh, dispatchable gas uh, power plants, to, uh, to also to cover for peak, uh, peak periods. 90% on a global scale means 100% uh, in a lot of areas because IEA doesn't consider you could uh, develop 
uh, nuclear power everywhere. So, I mean, there, there's a growing consensus that this is feasible. What is difficult is not to get to the, is not the result, is to get there. And I forgot to comment on one uh, very uh, important uh, uh, thing you, you said about the unstable mid-transition period. And actually, I think that's, that is the most difficult, politically speaking, and that refers to what I said about companies and about uh, states from a geopolitical perspective. I mean, we need to agree to desoptimize the system, to transform it into something more sustainable. It has been so much optimized, you know, from a cost-effectiveness uh, perspective. We need to desoptimize it. And it's obviously politically difficult. Uh, but uh, for the electric system, I mean, getting rid of what has been the basis of its security, which is, which is thermal dispatchable plants, I mean, it's going to be difficult everywhere and it's going to cost everywhere. But um, the, 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 the good news is an endpoint that is sustainable and based on renewables is really feasible as uh, we uh, see today. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm Dries from Belgium. I actually wanted to ask about storage, but you already okay. answered that. Um, but I, I want to come back to the to the innovation and mm -hmm. how this is modeled. So now there are values huge, but which values do you use or like where which estimates? Which value? F for uh, innovation, mm -hmm. how, how innovation is modeled. So what do you mean? How do, how, do how, you how, how is the, the levelized cost of electricity lowering over the years? How do you model which value put, do you put on this? All, all this kind of uh, um, economic value or, 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 um, or numbers of decrease? Everything that's innovation-wise, uh, yes, if that's clear. Um, because I, as far as I remember, in the scenario, you don't bet on, on major innovation. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, <coughs> another, uh, it, how is it, li is it linked in some way with, uh, with the results recently from Institute Huxo? Ah. <laughs> it's really similar. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the, uh, the, the data from the clever scenario is open data. And, uh, and so we are, uh, we are uh, I mean, it, the, this, uh, this scenario is used as the reference or one of the references by uh, many, uh, uh, many uh, academics or think tanks that uh, develop uh, assessment mm -hmm. of uh, the energy transition and uh, yes, uh, Institut Rousseau. Uh, I mean, if you if you sp talk about the the report that was out just a, a few days ago, uh, used a lot of our uh, of our data uh, to uh, to assess the costs of uh, energy transition, and they come to uh, the uh, conclusion that is intuitively obvious, but it's better when you. Uh, uh, when you uh, make uh, the calculation that sufficiency is uh, key to, uh, to uh, manage the overall uh, uh, amount of uh, investments. Um, and I think they are positive too on the, uh, on, on the development of renewables. Uh, there's another um, uh, study going on, I mean, with first results by uh, colleagues uh, in Belgium. Uh, I mean, it <laughs> Some members of the Clever uh, project are connected to uh, academics and they are using a model, uh, um, uh, an open uh, model called PIPSA to uh, assess the uh, electric security uh, of, the, uh, of the system and the costs and that provides also uh, positive results. Um, so, I mean, the... Uh, um, uh, in a sense, electricity <coughs> is, I mean, first we need electrification, and electricity is the area where, uh, where uh, deploying low carbon input uh, is the easiest compared to uh, mobilizing uh, bioenergies. I mean, we, we need uh, biofuel, uh, we need, sorry, uh, wood, we need uh, biogas, um, we need a bit of biofuels 
if we want to get rid of kerosene and keep some planes flying. But uh, that's, uh, I mean, that there are a lot of constraints and so on. There's, there are much less constraints <coughs> in deploying photovoltaics and to some extent uh, wind power. Um, so, but, but um, I mean, it's going to cost and the system needs to adapt. And as I said, I mean, there, there's innovation going on, but it takes time, which is also why we need sufficiency and efficiency uh, uh, in, in that area to, uh, yeah, to, to manage again the, the, the pace and depth of change without uh, negative, uh, negative impacts. But um, I mean, our, our, uh, the, the way we see innovation is something that is useful and needs to be integrated, but uh, can't be left to a kind of uh, magical bullet. You know, and, 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 and so we are cautious and uh, we are convinced that we are at the beginning of a big change and there's a lot of innovation going on. But uh, we uh, think uh, we, can't, we, we can only um, engage in that transformation with confidence that we can get to the end of it with what is already existing. That doesn't mean we are not confident that innovation will allow for uh, uh, making it even faster, deeper, with uh, better results. I don't, I don't know if that answers your concern, but... <laughs> Hello, my name is Stefan and I'm from Denmark. So I'm naturally very, very happy about this uh, windmill project that you've got <laughs> going here. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, fantastic, uh, but nonetheless, I, there's some there's an issue that you have not addressed, like somewhat at all, and that's the concept of not in my backyard. Uh -huh. I mean, we're uh, with Denmark is one of the countries that's very favorable towards windmills and the infrastructure of windmills, but still there we are having humongous problems mm -hmm. with actually people being willing to have this infrastructure built. I think like we this year or last year we pulled down more land windmills than we actually put up. So I was considering what are your thoughts on this uh, not in my backyard concept of people when it comes to land windmills. And my mm -hmm. secondary question was when it comes to um, windmills on the water, specifically the North Sea, <laughs> where I know that we are looking a lot into like what are the... When it's underwater, you say? No, no, on the water in the, in the, the Northern water. Sea. Like, offshore, uh, offshore. Uh, off, offshore, yeah, okay. like in the Northern Sea. Then I, then I know that uh, we have like many projects going there, but they're also being stalled because of the consequences for biodiversity in the region. We don't know what's going to happen underwater with the, with the fish or the birds, for example. So I don't doubt the plausibility of, of your presentation here and that it can happen, but my thing was more concerning these two, like the human reluctance and then also the consequences within biodiversity and like, you mm -hmm. know, if you have any remarks on these two things. Well, a lot. <laughs> uh, no, um, on, on the first part, uh, on, on the second part, I'm not sure if you, if you, if you were referring to return of experience in Denmark, or uh, a concern for project in France. But um, I mean, regarding offshore wind, uh, the return of experience from uh, the UK, for instance, that is uh, more advanced in uh, other countries, is that it is, it has a positive effect on biodiversity and uh, the uh, fish resource um, for two reasons. It creates, like a, like a, a, a shrunk boat, it creates artificial uh, um, uh, reef, how do you say it? Reef, artificial reef. So that's good for, uh, for, uh, for local biodiversity and because it creates a protected area uh, from uh, fishing, it actually helps uh, fishing resource to uh, regenerate. So, uh, I mean, there's a positive return of experience, uh, depending, of course, of on how you implement it. Um, and, I mean, there are also impacts when you install uh, those, uh, those uh, wind. Uh, windmills and I mean that that is dealt with uh, but I I don't think uh, the impact of wind power whether it's uh, onshore or offshore on biodiversity is a major concern uh, 
Okay, especially compared to uh, other activities. I mean, we, we should never forget that this is a way to get rid of other activities that have major environmental impacts, like oil, oil drilling, for instance. Um, on the first point, uh, I mean, it is obviously crucial. I told you we uh, keep the uh, number of uh, onshore uh, windmills to uh, roughly the double of today and much <coughs> lower than uh, the uh, rate of, uh, uh, of land uh, equipment uh, in Germany. Uh, that is for not only for uh, uh, concern with the landscapes and so on, but also for uh, concerns with acceptability. We know that is uh, that is an issue. Um, there are actually a lot of things that people accept because they are not explicitly uh, put as consequences of policies. Uh, and I think that we had a good example with the uh, yellow jersey uh, crisis in France. Uh, I mean, people were not told that we were implementing urban planning policies that would make them so dependent of cars for so increasing distances to cover. It. I mean, if this had been set as an outcome of the policies from the beginning, possibly people would have opposed it. So the, 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 I'm saying this because the problem with new projects is that they are explicitly bringing some change. So they are uh, prone to the, that kind of NIMBY, uh, NIMBY uh, attitude. Um, I'm, you, you will always get part of, uh, of NIMBY and, and you need to mitigate the local impacts, of course. Uh, but uh, we need those projects. I mean, the alternative is that we don't implement energy transition and then we get into increasing crisis that we uh, start <coughs> to see. I'm not sure people would want that too. What is missing? is the collective ID of a positive transformation. I mean, we have, and that's also part of the uh, global narrative we are, uh, we are exposed to, we have lost uh, a sense of collective or general interest to uh, the profit of our individual interests. And if you don't frame, politically speaking, this project, if you don't put some sense in uh, installing a uh, renewable project, both on the level of value creating for the territory and for the people and of a uh, global positive project on the national and European level, then NIMBY uh, attitudes will take over this collective interest. So we need this political work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm Yaksh, I'm from India. I actually had um, one question which carries forward what Stefan just talked about. And uh, I'm sorry, but I don't really agree with your response that you just gave because I feel like uh, when we look at your presentation as a whole, it's about modeling a scenario which doesn't optimize in a black box, but optimizes dynamically. Mm -hmm. and. The way I look at it is when you optimize, you also need to have functional, functional uh, representations of environmental costs. And one of the environmental costs of any uh, transition, be it an economic transition or um, a transition to sustainable energy or sustainable production, is also biodiversity cost. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, the example of uh, wind energy, for example, I feel your response is very case by case and circumstantial. But in reality, if you look at models which take into account biodiversity loss, they do have functions for biodiversity loss from nuclear uh, power, es uh, especially because nuclear power has uh, been, I mean, there is a direct causality between having nuclear reactors um, in any part of the country and biodiversity loss in that part of the country. Uh, so firstly that, um, what, what do you think about not having a functional representation of this in, in your model cost? Thank you. And Thank secondly, you. Uh, sorry, yeah, go on. I mean, I can stop there, but uh, there's just like one small um, uh, kind of locating where you stand in the larger literature on um, where 
I mean, I see your focus is also on um, transition in France and transition in the European Union. But when we look at the lar larger literature about decarbonization mm -hmm. in the European Union, um, there's also the idea that you know, the NDCs to the Paris Agreement also come from non-European countries. Yes. And uh, all kinds of climate targets outside the European Union also have impacts on the way the macroeconomy in the European Union gets impacted uh, and the feasibility and uh, kind of like effectiveness of climate targets within the EU. Uh, but you didn't really talk about that, um, especially in the global uh, context where China and India are often talked about uh, for their um, non-commitment to climate targets as well as high emissions. So maybe I, I would mm -hmm. love to know what you think about that. Okay, that's two, uh, <laughs> two, two uh, important questions. Um, on, on the one on biodiversity, <laughs> on the one on biodiversity, um, I mean, it is for the time being, impossible to assess the impact of a national scenario on biodiversity because I mean mm -hmm. biodiversity is species on the national uh, territory it's uh, local protected species it's the diversity of individuals within a species within any species on the local level and so on so you just can't really relate uh, a national trajectory to a global like aggregated impact on biodiversity what you can do is consider the main options in your scenario and their impact uh, when it comes to uh, onshore wind i mean uh, okay it could kill birds if it's birds as an average it kills much less birds then, and I can't remember in uh, which order, planes, uh, windows uh, in, on, on big buildings, cars, and I'm not mentioning uh, hunters, because our scenario doesn't say anything about hunters. But uh, when it comes to big uh, window uh, surfaces <coughs> of buildings, planes, cars, there are less of those in our scenario. Uh, and so it is very like I, I forgot to mention cats which are uh, the main I, I think cats are, are, are number one but uh, but no no I mean I mean but, but it's not the same birds the concern with wind with, with windmills is that they could kill protected big birds and uh, there's there are a lot of rules to prevent that to happen, I mean, uh, first in, uh, in, uh, in, in implementing, I mean, choosing uh, locations. Second, in setting uh, operating rules, for instance, to uh, shut, down, uh, shut down the mills uh, during uh, uh, migrations uh, and so on. So I, I don't think there is an activity, at least in France, that embeds so much uh, protective measures for uh, biodiversity than wind power, at least in France. Um, and when you look at a scenario like ours, again, reducing uh, transport and therefore pollution, uh, uh, developing uh, agroforestry, uh, breeding forests, reducing fat, uh, chemical fertilizers and so on. I mean, we have a lot of uh, changes in our scenario that w which we know have a positive impact on, on biodiversity and some which can have a negative impact, but we are convinced, as I explained for uh, wind power, that this negative impact can be mitigated. So we are very much convinced of the positive impact although we can't assess it on a, on a global basis. Uh, your second question was about, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the, what we are seeing about France and or, or the EU, EU in a world where they are depending on, uh, on the emerging economies and, uh, and so on. 
Uh, you could see it um, from, a, from two perspectives at least. Um, the first one is, um, I mean, the way, uh, the way uh, life size evolves, evolved in these emerging economies is a major concern for all of us. I mean, the reason why we have been accelerating on greenhouse gas emissions, depletion of resources and so on, over the past decade is because hundreds of millions of people have access middle class uh, middle class uh, per uh, purchase in China and India especially um, a few months before COP21 some people from the uh, French Ministry Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, approached us uh, because they wanted us to uh, reflect on some sufficiency uh, <coughs> policies that could be adopted by a coalition of countries. And at that time, I think, uh, their idea was that in the case of a kind of alliance between the US and China uh, that they feared could block an ambitious agreement at COP21, they could use that alliance, especially with India, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, counter uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, option. Uh, and they told us that people they were, telling with, uh, they were talking with in India uh, were very concerned with the signal we in developed <coughs> countries send to these emerging middle classes in, uh, in countries uh, like yours. Um, and we worked on that and we, we wrote a note for, uh, for COP21 saying sufficiency is not only about uh, meeting our objectives in the north, it's also about changing the signals we send to uh, populations uh, aspiring to a, a better lifestyle in emerging countries and it is a kind of solidarity uh, towards uh, populations in the even least developed countries uh, in the sense that any resource you save for a uh, useless uh, consumption in the north you could use it for a vital consumption in um, somewhere in the global south um, but so I think this perspective is still very useful and the work we have done in the clever scenario on you know how we how we uh, res how, how we think of the about the level of uh, of uh, energy services like square meters per person in housing like kilometers covered per person i mean access of the population to this i mean we need to frame it on a global level i mean you what I said about Romanian or Bulgarians when, uh, in, in our project is uh, obviously even uh, more true if you uh, uh, talk to uh, some populations in the south. So that is the first perspective. The second one, uh, faster, is, I mean, we, we, uh, uh, I mean we, we have developed an economy and geopolitics where we uh, send a lot of industrial polluting activities uh, in those countries. This has created de dependencies on both ends um, and we uh, need to relocate and reindustrialize. But again, if we think of this in terms of competition, I mean, that won't work. We need to think in terms of cooperation on, of, about how we locate industrial activities in different countries. First of all, for the sake and the good of local populations, and then sharing uh, when it is useful in terms of mitigating limitations in some countries by higher potentials in others. That's obviously an idealistic world, but uh, again, that is the direction uh, world leaders should set if we if we want to uh, put uh, if they want to uh, put us on the right uh, on the right pathway thank you very much eva <laughs>